Oh, yo, hey there. Today I decided to do something a little different. Usually I like to talk about games and stuff like that, but something I love just as much as gaming is film. So, let's take a look at the first movie we're going to review, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You may be wondering, hey Crouton, why are you reviewing New Line Cinema's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from the year 1990? Well, to answer that, I... I don't really know. So let's get started! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you've never heard of these guys, what rock have you been living under? The Turtles have got to be one of the most popular franchises ever, initially starting as a comic series created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. The comics were a decent success, to the point that tons of toys and action figures were made, there was a cartoon that was enjoyed and still enjoyed by many, and there were even NES games about the Turtles made by Konami. I grew up when the 2012 series was airing on Nickelodeon, but I didn't really watch it for some reason, so my first dive into the Turtles franchise was with the 80s cartoon. You may be wondering, Crouton, didn't you just say you grew up when the 2012 series was airing? Yes, and while I did watch TV quite a bit, I always preferred to pop in a DVD. I didn't have stations or channels in my room, but I had a big CRT and a composite DVD player. This isn't the DVD player I had, mine didn't have a VCR built into it, but it's pretty much the exact same player, same home menu screen and everything. Every night I'd either put in the first 12 episodes of Season 3 of Turtles, or I'd put in Season 3 of Spongebob. I fell in love with the franchise, despite only seeing less than 1% of it. But when it comes to the movie, I didn't see that until years later. So I guess let's talk about it now. With a budget of $13,500,000, filming for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie began in July of 1989, with the filming process finished in September of 1989, and despite the Manhattan setting of the movie, most of the filming was done in North Carolina. Since this was a live action movie, how exactly do you bring the turtles to life? You can't just have four adults in turtle costumes from Party City. Well, may maybe you could, I don't know. This is where Jim Henson's Creature Shop comes into play. The bodies of the turtles were made out of a flexible foam rubbery latex, so the actors inside could somewhat move inside the suit. The suits were hot, heavy, and uncomfortable for the actors, but they pulled through, which is something I can't imagine doing. I know I'd probably freak out. Jim Henson himself stated that the turtle suits were the most complicated things he ever worked with, and it shows. These things were quite ahead of their time with the animatronic face to convey emotion. It was a lot of work. This movie was gonna be big. The franchise itself was massive with the toys and the cartoon those airing at the time. Man, even Pizza Hut got in on the deal with the movie with a $20 million marketing campaign. That's almost double the budget the film had. There were product placements for a few different things, like Domino's, Burger King, and more. The movie was released on March 30th, 1990 in theaters, and October 4th, 1990 for home video. The movie... was a massive success. No surprise there. Critics didn't look at the movie favorably, but let's be real, no one cares. This movie was amazing. Kids, teens, adults, everyone loved this movie. Was it because of the plot? The humor? The fights? We're just seeing the characters brought into live action. Let's find out together. This is 1990's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Here we are in Manhattan. It seems like things are going well until, uh-oh, crime. There's a lot of theft in New York City for some reason, and it's all because some bad teenagers. They're taking everything. April O'Neil, news reporter for Channel 3, does a report talking about what NYC has dubbed the silent crime wave. Sounds like a cool 60s rock band. She leaves the news station, gets scared by a rat, mugging. Just as April's about to get mugged though, there's a sigh thrown at a light so that the turtles can tie up the criminals and save April. Raphael's upset because he lost the sigh that he threw at the light, and speaking of which, how does no one see him peeking out of the manhole? How did no one see him throw the sigh? April pretty much looked directly at him while grabbing the sigh, how did she not see a big pair of turtle eyes poking out onto the manhole cover? Anyway, we're introduced to the sewers, and once you see that awesome logo show up, you know it's going to be a pretty hype movie. We're also introduced to the turtles, and they're beautiful. People have called the 90s movie turtles creepy, which I guess I can see that. To me, I just find these things really cool. The work put into them is amazing. Really, all of Jim Henson's work I think is amazing, from The Muppet Show, Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, Dinosaurs, The Turtles, and much more. He really had a way with making fictional characters come to life, and he just seemed to brighten everything up. With the Turtles as mentioned earlier, so much work went into the animatronic facial features, the computer software for the animatronic facial features, the bells, whistles, buttons, switches, all that just to make Donnie smile. 
Moving on, Splinter is also introduced, which I gotta say, they absolutely nailed the mutated rat vibe for Splinter. He gives some wise ninja advice and everything seems to be going smoothly. Everyone is happy besides Raphael who just can't get over the fact that he lost a Psy. Like, dude, Splinter gave the turtles their weapons, were those the only size he had? Splinter goes on about he's gonna die soon and that the turtles will have to live without him. Upon hearing this, the turtles start dancing to their own version of tequila. Raphael is being a moody teenage turtle with moody teenage turtle hormones and leaves to go to a movie. After exiting the movie theater, Rav witnesses CRIME, and to combat the young robbers he uses his super special secret sacred ninjutsu art, tripping them. Raph then meets Casey Jones in a not so friendly manner. Because of this a fight ensues between the two, using sports equipment like baseball bats and cricket bats. Raph fights well but unfortunately can't do much without his other size, so Casey runs away. As you can probably tell, out of all the turtles, Raphael's kind of the main character. Cool choice, I guess, he was always my favorite turtle, but because of this, the other turtles are mainly there for comedic relief, which is fine, but I would have liked to see them utilized just as much as Raphael, maybe all of them going through some sort of issue like Raph does with his anger. It would be cool to see the other turtles overcome their personal trials as well. The movie continues in April's apartment, where we meet April's boss Charles and his son Danny. We see Danny at the beginning of the movie stealing stuff and here he is expanding upon his villain arc by stealing a 20 out of April's wallet. Ooh, so evil, so dastardly, so mischievous. Soon after, April is interviewing Chief Stearns of the police department and guess who's watching? Well, okay, yeah, the turtles are watching, but Shredder is too. After the interview, she talks to one of her co-workers and in the background we see Danny getting arrested for his crimes. April then tries to catch the subway, but she's too late, and then, oh no, bad guys! April gets knocked out, but Raphael is here to save the day. He beats up the foot soldiers, carries April through the subway tunnel, and into the sewers. Little does Raph know that there's one foot soldier following him. After bringing April back to the turtle lair, Leonardo calls Raphael crazy. Leo, my man, my turtle, he just saved your life, just chill. April wakes up and screams due to the fact that there are four mutant turtles and a mutant rat directly in front of her. Splinter goes on to tell her why he and the turtles exist, which the movie does do a decent job at explaining the origin story. However, the baby turtles are kind of terrifying, not gonna lie. Yeah, you heard me. The baby turtles are scarier than the full-on teenage mutant ninja turtles. April then invites the turtles over to her apartment, which results in Mikey doing a really bad Rocky impression. Uh, yo, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll fight Apollo, and, uh, maybe I won't, you know? But while they were gone, foot soldiers break into the lair and kidnap Splinter, and here we get to hear Raphael's response to the tragic situation. <laughs> cool! Remember Charles, April's boss? Yeah, he gets a call from Stearns. Remember Stearns, the chief of police? Yeah, Stearns talks to Charles about Danny. Remember Danny? Who could forget? He's Danny. Anyway, Danny's in trouble because he's a thief. Oh man, Danny's busted. Well, at least he'll be a good kid now. Or not. Dang it, Danny. Well, after Danny runs away, we get this scene with all these cool kids. Just look at them. They're so cool. Skateboarding, gaming, playing pool, graffiti, uh, g gambling, uh, smoking. Yeah, stereotypical gangster street punk secret organization stuff. It then transitions to kids training to be foot soldiers. This is where we meet Master Tatsu, Shredder's right-hand man. He appeared very early in the movie for like three seconds, but I didn't bother talking about it, well, because he was only there for like three seconds. After Tatsu beats up a student, Shredder calls a meeting, poisoning the minds of the youth. He then commands his soldiers to hunt down the turtles. It cuts back to April's apartment where Leo and Raph have an argument which results in Raph leaving to go blow off some steam. Man, he sure likes to do that a lot, just up and leaves. While he's having his tantrum, oh no, the bad guys are back! And there's a lot of them this time. Epic fight scene ensues, which then the fight moves into the apartment, the floor collapses, revealing more soldiers along with Master Tatsu. The turtles all take pretty good hits, especially Raph, he's uh, not looking too good. Also, Casey just kinda showed up. Good for him. Also, also, some guy hit the fuse box and now the whole building is on fire. Not good for them. April, Casey, and the Turtles escape through a conveniently placed trap door, and off they go. After Shredder gives Tatsu the stink eye because him and his men failed to eliminate the Turtles, Tatsu beats up a decent amount of his students, in an uh, interesting way to vent your anger there, buddy. 
While Tatsu is doing that, our main man Danny approaches the imprisoned Splinter. Here we go, the start of Danny's redemption arc. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a different scene now. Here, the new hiding spot for the turtles is April's abandoned childhood home or whatever. Oh, yeah, Raphael is nearly dead in the bathtub. No, seriously, I guess the bathtub was the best place they could put him. A bed? A couch? No, the bathtub. Raph eventually does wake up, and for a good 11 minutes, nothing really happens. I mean, the turtles train, April and Casey are starting to grow interested in each other, and Shredder and Tatsu talk for a good few seconds. That's about it. Around the end of those 11 minutes, though, Leonardo has some sort of awakening. He tells the other turtles that he knows Splinter's alive. They do this meditation thing around the fire, and the fire becomes... Splinter? I'm not entirely sure how it works either, but anyway, Splinter gives the turtles encouraging and emotional rat advice and then leaves. He didn't tell them where he was at or anything, he just said, Hey, uh, you, you guys are doing pretty good. Love you guys. Okay, bye. The next day, the turtles wake up and say, it's time to go back. So, we're back in the Manhattan sewers, and it looks like there's a visitor, and it's... Our boy, Danny! Danny takes a sketch of Leonardo that April drew at the farmhouse, Mikey and Donnie salute their fallen comrade, Moldy Pizza, Casey sleeps in the truck, and Danny is having a war within himself between being good or bad. He then tries to sneak out of the sewers, but Truck Napper over here follows Danny to Shredder's hideout. Danny goes to Splinter to talk, and Splinter goes on talking about his life story as his master's pet. After explaining that Shredder killed his master, Danny feels like a total bum. Yeah, yeah, good going, Danny. He then lets go of his evil ways, but as soon as he does, Shredder realizes that Danny has betrayed him. He steals the sketch of Leo and proceeds to send the Foot Clan to the sewers to hunt down the turtles. The turtles are beating them up, Casey is getting beat up by Tatsu until he finds a golf club and ends the fight pretty quickly. Casey and Danny rescue Splinter, the turtles chase the Foot Clan out of the sewers and onto the roof of a building, they get destroyed with epic turtle combat, meaning there's only one villain left to fight, Shredder. All four turtles get beaten up one by one, making them look really pathetic, like look at this, Leo just jumped forward both katanas out. What was he going to do? He was definitely going to get punished for that. What was he thinking? He just saw Raph get destroyed in like three seconds, what was this lunge forward going to do? Leo is held at spear point, and surprise surprise, the rat is back! Shredder takes a note out of Leo's book and just... charges forward. Splinter pulls a sneaky, Shredder pulls a sneaky, Splinter pulls another sneaky, Shredder then falls into a garbage truck, Casey pulls the lever to activate the compactor, and then the threat is gone. New York is free from the silent crime wave and the evil actions of Shredder. The turtles and Splinter reunite, Danny gives back April's $20 bill and reunites with Charles, and Casey and April finally accept the fact that they've fallen in love. The turtles celebrate their loss in Splinter's victory, calls themselves gnarly and tubular, but Splinter chimes in and says, Kawabunga. Hmm? Huh? Kawabunga! And that's the end of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As you probably picked up, the movie isn't that serious and went for a more comedic approach like the 87 cartoon, but it does take some elements from the comics, like Splinter being Hamato Yoshi's pet rat, while in the cartoon he was Hamato Yoshi turned into a rat. Even though I just said the movie isn't that serious, it still does have some serious parts, like when Splinter was kidnapped in the fire meditation scene, you could even see Mikey crying at that part. It has a few serious parts here and there, but it still had the comedic goofy charm that the turtles have. This movie's goofy, and it has some things I would have liked to see, but I like it. I really like it. I wouldn't say it's a childhood movie, it was more so an early teenager movie for me, but yeah, I love this movie to death, and it gave me an appreciation for fight scenes in film, more appreciation of the turtles, and an appreciation for the hard work and all the people it takes to make films. So yeah, in conclusion, the movie has some problems, but it is one of the funnest movies I've ever seen. Give it a watch if you haven't already. You'll have a lot of fun, trust me.